Welcome back to Archaeology After Dark, everyone. As, of course, you know, it is still the wonderful Archaeology Month here in the state of Alabama. And to continue our celebration, my guest today is Nina Jean Luis. Nina, thanks for being here. Hi, thanks for inviting me on here. I'm excited for today. Me too. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself. So how did I find myself in this world of archaeology? <laughs> oh, maybe we could start there, right? Um, so I actually, um, my whole career is in structural engineering. I'm actually a um, structural designer. That's what my undergrad is in. My undergrad is in civil engineering. But I've always had um, a love for historic and cultural sites and try to figure out with the engineering background how I can mesh those worlds together. So my master's in historic preservation came along um, in New York. I went to Pratt Institute and that's how I was able to intermesh the two. But then this kind of other layer of, okay, well, how do we protect our cultural heritage sites from climate change impacts like this whole resilient climate layer started come into the picture. And now I'm at the University of Miami doing my doctorate in the Department of Civil and Architectural Engineering, combining basically anthropology with data science and um, systems engineering as a way to come up with a community-based resilience decision-making model for cultural landscapes. I know that was a mouthful, right? <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be a science if it wasn't. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, if it if you can explain it to somebody in like five minutes, I don't necessarily consider it a science because science isn't easy to explain. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all, not at all. So I kind of fell in this realm of archaeology. I mean, truthfully speaking, I've always wanted to be an archaeologist since I was a kid. I was like, instead of playing with Barbie dolls, I was playing in the dirt. I was identifying plants. I was doing all these different like things outside but um what ended up happening is my dad's an engineer so that kind of put me on the engineering track and always trying to find a way back to it somehow and this is how I landed so that leads us into what we're going to talk about today so I'm going to start off by saying we're not going to debate whether climate change is an actual thing or if it's something that's made up by the government or some other fictitious entity that people believe is out there in the world we're here to talk about how climate change actually affects historic locations yes. so what is the biggest uh i guess obstacle for preservation as far as climate change goes in your opinion well at first it actually um you know already a lot of these sites that are, and I'm talking documented sites, I'm not even talking right now of undocumented sites, which I'll get to in a bit, but these documented sites that, you know, we are seeing are already at risk because of their age, um, and they're in various degrees of structural health, and so when you're having a building that's already having these vulnerabilities, see more increased intensity of rainfall or more intense storms, more frequent storms such as hurricanes, it is really cutting that service life by years and years and years. And so that's in terms of the documented sites, how it's being impacted. Specifically, if I'm talking about Florida, we have a lot of coastal heritage sites. And so kind of the two biggest climate challenges that we're seeing right now is rising sea levels as well as extreme heat. And so with rising sea levels, it's a permanent change. It's not something that is like a flood that recedes temporarily um, and you're kind of going back to normal every day. Like with rising sea levels, these buildings and these sites are gonna see a completely different environment. Some of them are gonna be underwater. So it's putting a bit of pressure on our industry to understand like, how are we documenting these? How can we actually be more proactive in their protection instead of reactive? Because you know, preservation as a whole, at least in the United States has been a pretty reactive movement. And I know that's a little controversial to say, but that's, to me, that's kind of where I stand in as in, you know, where I stand in the preservation realm. I'm 
much more of an advocate of proactive measures and understanding how can we get ahead of certain things such that, you know, the, the site can be able to be of use to the community for future generations to come. And so with that, now we're kind of going into undocumented sites, the more vulnerable sites, I, I presume, because these undocumented sites, such as underrepresented heritage sites that are of specific minority communities, they're not even on the register, the national register or municipal register. So already they're, they're already starting at a vulnerability, like higher than what is documented. And then when you basically put that layer of climate risk on top of it, it it's compounding that vulnerability. So a lot of the work that I'm focused on right now is understanding how can we actually find more of these sites and specifically, I'm using AI machine learning. Um, how do we find more of these sites such that they can be recognized and be on the same level as a national designated site, such that they can get the resource allocation for preservation thereof? So that's that's kind of the big concern. So you have the difference between documented and undocumented sites that both see climate risk a little differently. Yeah, I imagine, you know, climate risk is different, you know, as the climate is different, you wouldn't have the same challenges at a site in Florida that you would have, say, somewhere on the eastern seaboard or somewhere, you know, that's inland, like in Kansas or something. Correct. Yes, it's a different natural disaster risk, um, as well as construction methods, too. There's different materials that are used, say, in the Northeast than it is here in, in South Florida. That's why, like, in South Florida, you rarely see any historic brick structures. It's more in North Florida because climate, the climate in the 30s and the 20s was a lot colder, and then in the North, it gets a lot colder. So use, utilizing brick made sense because of its thermal insulation properties, where wood was very prominent here in South Florida. However, it's not the strongest building material. So, you know, since 1926, we've seen maybe three or four major hurricanes hit the area. And so a lot of those historic houses that were wooden, there's very few far in between in, in a lot of the historic neighborhoods here in South Florida. Yeah, I imagine, you know, especially with violent weather phenomenon like hurricanes makes preservation of a vexing challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And also we're we're in an area of South Florida, Miami in particular, that's very pro-development. And um I'm not against development. So let me like clear the air on that. But I will say like unconscious development where it's not including communities' desires. Um is problematic. And we're seeing a lot of this development happen in areas that are historically minority communities, such as Overtown, Liberty City, as well as Little Haiti, all of these areas, because they actually sit on the ridge, the highest ridge um, in Florida, where now we're starting to see climate gentrification where people from say Brickell who are experiencing this like these king tides and you know daytime flooding are now kind of flocking into these areas that um, that are unfortunately being developed to serve that need and not really bringing the community into those conversations, especially when they're looking at certain sites that have a lot of historic um, houses or historic uh, building, you know, just built built environment overall, where they don't even know what to do with some of these sites. They don't even know the adaptive reuse that's possible and changing the use of one to form another. And so that's that's really been going on for several years here. It's just as each year goes by, it's becoming much more of a significant challenge. Yeah, I did an episode not long ago where we talked about the condominium development in the Miami Circle and how it's an exhausting process. Yeah, and I and I don't know, you know, I would love to get your thoughts on this too, as as being an archaeologist yourself, um, because I'm not incredibly well versed in the archae, you know, the archaeology review process that happens when you you're developing on a, a new plot of land and then hey you find something that is like 
you know, indigenous related or native related, or it could be any, you know, historic community related. But um, what I've seen is just kind of the flaws of the process and how, you know, bringing like when to bring the community in and like you're now seeing this kind of war this kind of common enemy of like hey we have the developer against the community and it's just like I wonder if there's a better process or the process has to be reformed somehow some way so um I would actually really love your thoughts on that <laughs> to so, give me insight on that so in my experience of as an archaeologist, we're kind of like in the middle, like we want to serve the community, but we yeah. also, you know, want to be friends with the developers because they're the ones who pay for our projects. The community, while they're invested in it, that's more of a, I guess, a spiritual investment. So we want to do everything we can to protect the site, but we also like getting paid to yeah, so it's that kind of the two, those two factions there. I mean, we have the historical review board here in Miami, but even just with that and them having their town hall meetings, like they didn't even allow for a lot of the indigenous community to speak about the property and the land. Um, you know, so there's a lot of corruption and bureaucratic red tape involved in the process too. But this is what, what we're faced with, you know, I mean, this area of Miami was the Tecesta capital um, and has a lot of rich culture with both Miccosukee, Seminole um, and, you know, Miami tribes, just to name a few, not an expert on it, but, um, you know, we're, we're seeing more of this challenge to heritage that are minorities, more minority communities, as we're seeing this rise of development where, the community is having less of a voice. And so individuals like myself and, you know, others who are involved in archaeology and anthropology departments throughout all of South Florida, we're really trying to see how best we can work with developers, how best we can work with the cities uh, to come up with collaborative solutions. But it's just, it's been really, really challenging. So. Yeah, that's something that, you know, I've noticed in the few years that I've been an archaeologist is that while legislation and processes are in place, I think you said it best earlier that they're more reactive than proactive because they aren't designed to deal with, you know, everyday things that we come across in the field. Like, yeah, repatriation is something that is happening but it's still a very complicated process whether something actually gets returned to the people who actually owned it absolutely and that and that is a really big thing i mean like the preservation movement started because of the demolition of penn station in the 60s it was a reactive movement like oh man this thing is getting demolished ah what do we do what do we do let's put a law on it right and and it's since then been this reactive also there there is this like more you know we also have to decolonize you know our, the preservation movement as well and it, it's it did start as more of elitist looking at some of these really wealthy architectural civic structures mansions that really were the focus of a lot of um funding and a granite the majority of people that started this movement um, were not just your typical community member. They were very wealthy, like, I love the arts type of people and I want to, you know, provide funding for that. And, you know, it, it doesn't have the most solid foundation and start in the U.S., but, you know, I think with events that have happened within the last 10 years, we're starting to see that shift of you know, especially with climate change and climate change, it even though we're seeing the impacts of it today, it's still, you know, some people may think of it as some far off notion, right? And so it is pushing the boundaries of uh, how we do preservation and how it needs to be pro more proactive and really more so not just only the protection of the site itself, but build educational awareness, you know, already we're already kind of at a barrier because most people don't really get why we need to preserve an older structure like 
nine times out of 10, anybody you may talk to be like, oh, that abandoned house on the end of the street. Yeah, no one used that. Like, that's not important. But when you start talking to the community and you start learning about what that site may represent, like now you're starting to understand the value behind it. And so I think our role is, you know, multifaceted where we're not only having these conversations of, hey, this particular, you know, climate event or hazard is going to impact your site. But also, do you do you know the value of the site? Like, do you do we have do we know the story behind it and being facilitators in that as well? Yeah, that's something I, I brought up in another episode uh, not too long ago is that sites differ because of who the person was who was related to it. Like, say, uh, George Washington's house at Mount Vernon was one of the first, yes. you know, big historic preservation projects right. in the United mm -hmm. States. But you also compare that to, say, you know, an enslaved cemetery. They're both equally important historic sites. One just gets more attention because George Washington was a prominent historic figure who's featured on our money. Yes. And I love how you actually like told that story because that's where the inequities are in preservation. You know, that not all heritage is treated the same because of a story or who is attached to that site. And so that's something with, at least with this, you know, part of the project I'm working on for my dissertation is utilizing, you know, this, this, this machine learning um, that I'm still wrapping my head around. <laughs> I never thought in a million, I mean, I know I'm an engineer, but I never thought in a million years I would actually be doing like data science and analytics and working with AI. But I mean, we have AI every day, like here on our phone, but understanding like, what are the actual narratives that are are currently being told about certain sites. Is that narrative actually the true narrative or is it a narrative that unfortunately is impacted by say a colonized narrative or, um, you know, so that's, that has been kind of where I've been seeing the preservation movement kind of like shift is actually making sure that when we are investigating a site for protection for rehabilitation, restoration, reconstruction, whatever the purpose is, understanding what the narrative of that site represents. Is it is it the real existing or is there is there a hidden one there that we have to kind of thread out? So Yeah, and that's you know something fun when you actually do go visit like an older historic site that's been repurposed for a different thing is you know, like, for example, I live in Huntsville, Alabama, and there's an old uh, boot factory from Vietnam where, you know, they've turned into like an artist colony, but they still have, you know, exhibits and pictures from the building's history on display on the first floor. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that, you know, because at the end of the day, these sites are going to be repurposed. Um, if it's not within, say, a, a generational lineage of a family, um, these sites are going to be repurposed for today's use. And I think one of the best ways that anybody who is either buying or a developer that's coming in to potentially adaptively reuse a building is tell the story of what it used to be, no matter if it's a negative story. And I think that's something also in the preservation movement. And I just think maybe this is more of a cultural thing here in the United States um, you know, I grew up in the United States. However, I grew up in a very different culture than that of the United States. I grew up in a very Latin and Caribbean culture, which is a more group harmony uh, centric culture. And so talking about, you know, and we see examples in Germany, we see examples throughout Europe, Rwanda, where they don't shy away from the negative histories that some sites have but here in the United States it's a challenge we are challenged with addressing the negative histories of sites and knowing how to you know facilitate that story in an objective way and facilitating that with the community that represents that heritage um it's that's that's been another challenge I've seen as well yeah that's something that you know with 
people becoming more and more progressive with how they look at historic preservation and how they show history to people is they realize that, yeah, history has scars in it. And it's up to us to, you know, put not necessarily put those scars on display, but put them where people can learn from the mistakes of the past and not obviously repeat them. I can't believe I just quoted that. I mean, <laughs> but, I mean, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's just, it's, it's a shame that we actually have to keep saying that, right? Where, you know, we, we shouldn't be repeating these past lessons, but they keep happening, right? And so obviously there is something missing there in terms of educational awareness that's not there. There is generational false narratives that have been developed. And it's like, how do we unravel that? How do we approach that? Um, and I always say this because, you know, just from my experience and working with in preservation advocacy, which is the kind of community engagement arm of historic preservation, something we have to be very careful of is when we're going into these communities, we work with the community. We're not saving the community. And there's this big divide between a lot of preservationists and, and community members. And I think this goes for a lot of different um, disciplines when you're doing community work is that we cannot come in there with a savior mentality. Like, oh, you're underrepresented community. There's this whole, whole big thing that I have been researching, which is damage centered research by Eve Tuck. Um, I can provide you the article, um, you know, so that you can include it in the notes. But when we're working with, with communities that are considered underrepresented, under-resourced, um, we have to be very careful, especially in the heritage realm, say, as we're maybe uncovering some sites, both intangible and tangible heritage of the community that may have that negative history attached to it, right? How do we move from this perpetuation of damage, reminding the community of this damage? How do we move forward from that? to maybe what Eve Talk has described as a more desire focused research versus damage where you focus on the survivorship, the resilience of the community. And um, because at the end of the day, especially with work um, dealing with underrepresented heritage, this is a big, big complex issue. Um, and sometimes because of the word underrepresented, under-resourced, Though the intention is is really good from the start, a lot of experts, subject matter experts in preservation, architecture, engineering, archaeology will come into the community with that savior mentality. And that already shoots down the trust of the community because the community is like, I don't need you to save us. Like, we well, don't need, no. We know what we want for ourselves. Like, we just want people to work with us and, and help us get our voices heard. And that's why I also have issues when we're using terms like we're trying to empower the community um, because the community already has the power. We're just, you know, we're just working together to understand what tools and methods we can bring that power more out to bring that authority, that sovereignty over what happens to their heritage resources. Yeah, and that's a term a lot of, or I've noticed it a lot over the past few years is uh, re-traumatization is when we go yes. into the community, we want to, you know, address the traumas of the past, but we don't want to interpret it in a way to where it hurts the community all over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's, that's where it's extremely challenging, you know, when you're when you're walking with these negative histories and trying to understand them, how it is impact, because it's a part of the community's identity either way, but it's understanding how to shift from that trauma to survivorship and resilience. And I'm personally still wrapping my own head around it with this desire centered framework that Eve talk, talks about, like shifting from that damage centered, the reminder of what happened to them, that 
these histories that are associated with some of these sites to something that's more desired centric of, okay, yeah, we walked through that, but here we are. This is how we're thriving. And how can we continue to illustrate that survivorship instead of the damage? Like, this is how we're doing, despite of the horrificness of this thing that happened here. We know it was here, but we are still here despite of that. Yes. And this is important because before we can even address the idea of climate change and risk, like we have to first, we have to first approach the past, right? And, and what the, the sites represented from the past before we can even think about the future. So it's it's really a two pronged approach. It's like you know we have to understand the site's narrative and what what that existing narrative is, and working with the community to see if that's the actual narrative that they want to tell. It's it's up to them. It's not up to the, us. I always say us as professionals in this field of archaeology, architecture, preservation, and engineering, we're facilitators. We're facilitating. We're stewarding the process. We're trying to bring the right people out at the you know forefront of the table to say, hey, we have a site. We know that this area experience is going to experience this climate change event. But before we can even go there, what is the narrative about the site? Is it negative? Is it positive? How, how do you want to tell this story? Because that's the story that's ultimately going to live hopefully through whatever climate um, reset they're seeing. So we're about out of time. Uh, Nina, any last minute advice you want to dish out for anyone who's interested in studying preservation, you know, books they can read, uh, people they can talk to, things like that? Oh, of course. I mean, I could definitely provide you a list um, in our, you know, for the show notes or whatnot. But ultimately, preservation is such a big field. Um, you can do so much. Um, I am coming from more of the building technology side of architecture and engineering, so I could really speak to that. But there's law, there's conservation, there's advocacy. So when you're looking to maybe perhaps pursue preservation, make sure that you're looking at schools that if, if you want a full interdisciplinary background, I have those for you. But if you want a certain um, building technology background, there's certain schools that cater to that. But um, it's, it's, I mean, I'm a little biased, but I liked walking down that track. Um, but I, I also have some books that also bring to light a lot of the topics we, we were talking about today. Well, Nina, thank you so much for joining me today. It has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> All right, everybody. That's going to do it for today. Tune in for more. Bye. <laughs>